guests. I have uh, my friend Kristen Halleck. She's the head of customer success at Bold, which is a super cool company in the health tech space. So she's going to tell us all about that. But before we start, I have to tell a fable about how I met Kristen. And this is this is a great example of again networking and using um, using all your connections to find people who can totally support you. So Kristen and I met through a mutual investor, and I knew it was love at first sight because she showed up on my video call, our intro call, with a scrunchie. So I, I knew she was the one. But Kristen, I'll let you give yourself a more professional intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Uh, I'm a huge scrunchie fan. I don't know why we ever um, stopped using them. So I'm really grateful that we're, we're back in that mode. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm super grateful that our um, mutual investor connected us because I was wandering as kind of a lost puppy through the digital health marketing space and Kat swooped in and, and reassured me that we all basically don't know what we're doing, but at the same time, we're all uh, ready to be here and can totally take on the task. So just figure it out. Just figure it out, right? Yeah, we figured things out. So it was really nice to hear from somebody else, a, a uh, fellow figure it out kind of person. So yeah, um, I'm the head of customer success at Bold. We are a clinically curated evidence-based fitness platform for older adults, so 65 and up. Um, and we focus on uh, creating a fitness that is meets people where they're at so they can age at home, um, you know, manage life and, and feel happy and healthy. Um, and you know, our lifespan uh, relative to how long people actually live, there's there's this gap. And so we're trying to close this gap and make sure everybody can live, um, you know, 200 years old if they want to. So absolutely, the goal and we're, we're excited to be doing it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I want to hear more about Bold. But first, so you were kind of like the startup queen. Um, so, so, you know, Kristen helped me too, you know, I went through a recent exit, uh, with collective, collective medical. And I remember you reached out and you, and you, you kind of like gave me some reassuring words. It was my first time ever doing it. And I know it's, it's like not even close to your first time. So talk to me about this, this, you, you seem very attracted to kind of this early stage growth phase type in between, um, which, which, which is cool. I, I think it's cool to find people who are into that phase. Yeah, so I started at a healthcare startup out of college kind of on accident. I graduated college in August of 2008 when like the whole world fell apart the last time. Um, and I literally just wanted a job with a cubicle and health insurance. So I was like, great, I'll do anything. I oh my gosh, I wanted a cubicle too. Like that was like, you, you like made it if you got a you cubicle. You made it. You had a phone and an extension and an email, like it was it. And so this healthcare startup hired me as what I now would refer to like a BDR type inside sales role. And they're like, you will cold call 80 doctors a day and ask them to join our network. I didn't know what a healthcare network was. I was beyond thrilled to just be uh, employed. <laughs> and so I joined it. And what I learned is we were a series A funded um, healthcare startup creating a national rehabilitation network for self-insured employers uh, for when their uh, employees got injured at work, we would coordinate the rehab for them. I, the, none of those words existed in my vocabulary when I started working there. Um, but yeah, I went on to be uh, in leadership at that company. We acquired five companies while I was there and then ultimately got acquired. Um, and after that, I moved on to, um, Bold is now my fourth startup. So I moved to two startups in between that. Um, and then I went to do a small stint. I did about two years at a large medical group that was owned by DeVita, but then acquired by Optum shortly after I started. So I kind of got this experience in this corporate world of healthcare that I had never quite seen before. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both, but I personally love early stage seed series A round startups, walking them through and getting them to that point of exit because um, there's so much room for innovation, creativity, uh, learning, building things from the ground up from scratch. I love a blank sheet of paper because it's, it's whatever you want it to be. So I really love that. Um, I don't feel as limited as I do in like more corporate settings. Um, so yeah, I've been known to be the startup queen because I'm on number four and hoping that it's equally as a success as some of the others I've been a part of. 
<laughs> right on, right on. So, so I have a question for you uh, about, about team building and the blank page, right? So um, I, I'm kind of in the same boat. I've never really worked for a big company, right? Um, I, I've never really inherited a team. I've almost always, I, I could probably say always if I thought about it, built teams from scratch. And, and I think it's, it's kind of an interesting skill set, right? And it sounds like you may have had the opportunity to do both, both kind of take on a team at a larger company and build from the ground up. I'd love to hear which one you think is easier or, or just in general, what do you think about that? Uh, I think acquiring a team through an acquisition or merger is the most challenging I've ever done mm. because at the time I was like 27 years old now managing people who are probably later to close to retirement stage of their careers that are like, who are you? <laughs> like, what do you know about what you're doing? And my company bought yours. So I'm now your boss and they're really good sports about it. And I learned a lot. But that's very challenging. You didn't pick them. You know, they come with resentment, baggage, you know, all like there's a lot that kind of goes into that. Um, I, if I have the choice, I'll always build my team versus um, absorb a team just because, you know, you get to pick the people you would want to work with. You get to go through the interview process. You get to, you know, fill out their personality and their work styles and build a team that complements you. Um, but you don't always get to do that. And there's definitely ways to absorb a team that you didn't hire and make them your own. It's just a lot of effort and you have to be willing to put in that time and those resources. And you have to know that trust equals consistency over time. So you have to be willing to put in the time and the consistent communication and mentorship and effort if you actually want them to trust you and, and see you as a valued leader. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's actually really good advice is that is the trust is, is consistent equals consistency over time, right? I think that um, uh, a, a lot of times what, what I've seen at least work consulting for companies that have been acquired um, is yeah, the, the teams often have a very, very rough transition and it's those leaders that spend the time and really work it, I think is, um, is key. So, um, so I also want to, so back to bold. Okay. So, so I actually do not, I've been in health tech for like a long old time, like my whole career, like kind of like you, like the great recession was kind of my jam. Um, and, and I don't know anything about age tech, like not a bit. So you need to educate us. About a 2021 trend report that, um, older adults are adopting technology at alarmingly high rates. Um, I think part of it has to do with COVID kind of forced our hand in terms of needing to stay connected. Um, but they're also, um, older adults still want to learn. They still want to adapt. They still want to be able to do current things and experience current technology. So this kind of myth that older adults will not use and adopt technology, um, I'm happy to see kind of being dispelled by COVID and the data showing that they will use it and they're interested in using it and interested in learning just like you and I are. Um, and so when you think about age tech, it's a lot of people are thinking about it kind of in the context of like remote patient monitoring. How do we give people devices that allow them to stream data back to their providers and make actions around their care plan in real time? You know, what someone like Bold is doing is how do we provide in-home safe clinically driven fitness programs for older adults um, so that they're not expected to, let's say, go to a um, 24 hour fitness type gym uh, and just know how to work out and know what um, is safe for them, what their con what's contraindications for, you know, disease they might have or injury they might have. So providing a comfortable, safe environment for them in their own home to be able to access fitness that might uh, otherwise not have been accessible for them. Got it. Got it. So, so tell me how you chose bold as a company to employ me. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah there, are a lot of there are a lot of choices right now, right? I mean, it's, it's like a crazy market for health tech. It's really hard to, to hire good people. And so, yeah, what, what attracted you to them? Yeah. So when I look at a company, I look at a couple of things. Um, I look at who, who's running it slash owning it, you know, who are the co-founders? Why did they start the company? I think a lot of health tech companies are started by people that have never worked in healthcare. They don't understand the industry. They come yeah. from like a, maybe a FinTech background or something. 
and many of those companies have been wildly successful and that's great and i i sure that they're going to be you know they'll be fine but for me i want to work um i want to work for co-founders that are passionate about the industry passionate about healthcare and and helping find a solution um, and make an actual impact and make an impact to the member i want us to create a better member experience i'm all about creating preventative solutions um you know, rather than treating people when they become sick with chronic conditions, how can we help them live more autonomously and have more control over their health before they become, um, you know, sick or costly to the health health uh, industry? So I look at all those factors. Um, you know, I look at the team. I think about uh, who am I going to be spending my time with? Uh, my barometer for if I like working with you or not is like, do I think I could fly cross country with you to like a conference or a meeting with a client and deal with you on the plane? Because um, people are very different when they travel versus like in the office. <laughs> this is what people usually say about like finding your life partner, by the way. I love that you are applying this to business. <laughs> more time with my company than I do my life partner. So it's very important to me that I could, I could deal with them on a cross country. <laughs> so to me, that's, you know, what I look for. I mean, I also, I love customer success. I love managing relationships with health plan and provider partners. I love working with them to find innovative solutions. So to me, um, being in this type of role, what Bold was offering me in terms of what I, I could be doing today and how I could grow was really appetizing to me. Oh, that's awesome. So, okay. So let's go, let's go back to the, the head of success thing and, and you loving success. So when I met you, you were, so you were, you were kind of leading go to market, right. At another startup um, and, and working on marketing. And then you also told us you started out your career essentially in sales. So like you, and, that, and that's one of the things that really attracted me to you when we first met, I was like, this girl does all the things and she figures it out, right? I think that is I, that is one of my favorite qualities in anyone is they're just like, I'm just going to Google how to do this. And I'm going to figure it out, right? So so talk to me talk to me about that journey. Where did you find success as your niche in, in all this? Yeah, it's funny because this is my first success role, like my <laughs> customer success role. But what I realized is customer success is, it, it's a few things combined. It's Yes, it's sales. You have to be able to have conversation, show value, demonstrate ROI to a client. So they want to continue to work with you and work with you even more. It's relationship building. And I love it. Like I love networking like this. I love having conversations, connecting with people, figuring out what makes them tick. How are they measured? What's success to them? How do we make that valuable to them? Um, so it's sales, relationship building, it's operations and project planning, which I have three day planners on my desk in front of me as I'm talking to you right now. I love- I don't. I love like I lists. I love documentation. I love process. I love operations. I think that's why I like startups so much because you come in with that blank slate and people are like, what's the process for onboarding a new hire? You're like, oh, we don't have one. We're just going to make it. So like, <laughs> I love creating the process journey maps from scratch. So to me, it was like, I, I landed on customer success because I realized all the things I loved about sales, what I loved about marketing, what I loved about running an, an ops call center team and put it all together. And it turned into, oh, that's what customer success is in like the modern day industry. And like, that's what I'd really like to be doing. Oh, that's awesome. So, so you can kind of do all the things in this role. I think that's cool. I think that sometimes I feel like customer success gets, gets the people kind of just say, oh, it's, it's support, right? Um, but I, I've seen some very sophisticated success works that, yeah, like you're saying, yeah, it's kind of all the things you're selling, your marketing, relationship right. management, all the things. To me, it's like I was talking with my CEO Bold today, Amanda, about social impact. Like social impact is like what we're here to do as a company. Customer success is like what we're here to do as a company. If our members, our, if our customers aren't successful, it means we're not impacting the member. And ultimately, we're here to change their lives and give them, you know, autonomy to age healthy at home. And so to me, like customer success is like the ethos of what we're trying to do at Bold. And then, yeah, it, it is comprised of all these like tactics and components and ways that you get to that end goal. 
Right, right. So let's talk about this because I think this is kind of an age-old argument too that like, you know, sometimes a company says they're they're all about their customer or whatever, but they're really all about the sales, right? And it, that goes back to what you were saying about picking a company uh, and finding one that really believes and isn't just about, you know, making money, uh, having a fantastic exit of some sort, right? Um, so, so have you experienced that kind of sales uh, client success tension? And and if so, I mean, how do, how do you get around it? Deep breath. Thinking and being thoughtful in terms of how I respond to this. Um, so I think I think there's always tension with sales and other departments in general at every org I've worked at because sales to a degree feels most of the burden and pressure of like, we have to hit revenue for this company to succeed, grow, expand, whatever the you know outcome mm-hmm. is. And so sales gets a lot of pressure up front on like they're responsible for the most tangible, visible metric usually of like what the organization is doing. And so I think that often can translate to stress or tension with other departments if they feel like it's not that department isn't in support of or delivering on what they need to do to hit their goals and ultimately the company goals. So I think like sales is often in a tough spot of like, they they have to advocate for what they need and the customer needs, but it can often come off as like sales always needs this or they're complaining about that or they, and I've been that salesperson where people are like, oh my God, Kristen needs this again. Like it's it's never good enough. Um, So yeah, there's always tension. Um, but I think there can be healthy tension. I think you can be thoughtfully confrontational and bring things up and, and have healthy debate on what does a customer really need versus what is a customer potentially just complaining about, but it's not a core solution to our business or something that a road that we want to go down. So yeah, there is tension. I think it's how you deal with it. And I think it's the trust that sales has with their internal partners. Um, you know, as a marketer, like I looked at sales as my customer, I was delivering a product to them that they were going to go out and sell. And so uh, how could I have been in service to them? But then also they have to reciprocate that in terms of um, the relationship. So yes, tension, I think it's just a matter of like being, do the two teams trust each other um, enough to allow that that tension to be healthy or is it going to become toxic because they feel like one isn't doing what the other one's asking and it becomes kind of a pointer or finger pointing game. Yeah. Yeah. So you've mentioned trust a few times, uh, in the past few minutes, the dozen minutes, uh, how do you, how do you build trust in an organization? Right. And more than that, how do you repair trust where it's already gone bad? Yeah. So uh this is a hard question it is a hard question and (laughs) the first thing that comes to mind for me is like actions speak louder than words and that's such like a cliche like we've all been told that a million times but it's really true um if if you say i'm on your side like i'm gonna take care of you like i got you and then the second reviews come around it's like I couldn't get you a raise this year. Like, I don't know, there's some things happening. Like it's the actions. It's like, maybe I trust you on the first time because it was a hard year and it was COVID and maybe, but like, and you say, you're going to help me out in six months from now. And then six months comes and it's kind of another excuse. So to me, it's like being clear and always communicating transparently. But as a leader, you have to be careful of like what the bounds of that are. Like you can't overshare. Um, but what can you share that's appropriate that gives people a sense for like, where are we at? If you know, in your gut, like no one's getting a raise this year because we missed revenue, like don't mislead people and like give them, keep them on the hope train that we're going to get raises just because hope you train. feel bad or don't want to deliver the news, right? Like you have to be realistic with people. People are adults. They want to be treated like adults. They want to be communicated with clearly. Um, so I think it's, it's clear communication. It's making sure that you're not giving them lip service and then constantly going against or doing the other thing. Um, One example is like when you're 
you know, when you're training a new hire, you're always on like your best behavior. You're like, this is how it's supposed to be done. Like we built the process this way and you do it this, but then in the background, you're like, but don't do this part. I just do this because it's easier. And you're like, skipping here's this workaround. This yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that like immediately breaks trust in the process. And that type of scenario can happen um, throughout. And then I think it's like visibility of your leadership, right? Like are your leaders these like ethereal people that nobody ever sees or hears of, or they're like scary, or if they're in a meeting, it's like to do a drive-by for culture or like just to deliver bad news or, you know. So how is your leadership seen? Do they feel like real people? Or are they actually like engaged in the culture and the organization? Do they trust that the figureheads are actually like steering the ship in the right direction? And then how do you repair it? Um, I mean, I just think those things consistently over time, like you, you have to be willing to share the dirty bits and, and have conversation and say when you did something wrong as a leader, it's hard. Like you still make mistakes. We're human. We say dumb things or we do the wrong thing or we make the wrong call. And someone will trust you if you're willing to say, hey, I did the dumb thing. I made the wrong call. I didn't listen to you. And yeah, you're right. We did cost, that did cost more money or delayed the project. And I see why. So how, being as a leader, being able to be self-aware and reflective and communicative on those lessons that you're learning, it shows your team that you're a real person and you're trying just like them. Um, and I think that they'll trust you and they'll trust your judgment a lot more rather than doing everything in the dark and in a silo from them. And then they can't really orient themselves. Like why are decisions being made and how are we doing things? Um, so it's definitely a balance. It's hard. I've gotten it wrong a million times. Sometimes I get it right. <laughs> Same. Um, but if you're a real, genuine, authentic person and you're just your real self and honest with people about things, they can sense that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I also love what you said about just being honest. Like, you know, if 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 you can't get someone a raise or if there's bad news to be delivered, I I hate the approach of of holding someone hostage to the future. And I think that actually, I think leaders often do that by saying, oh, if you'll just hold on six months or, um, you know, at this point, a year from now, this will happen, you know, we'll promote you in a year. Um, I think from the leader's perspective, they're doing that because they want to keep the person, but they, but, and, and they think that kind of doing that is going to make them stay. I've actually seen the opposite happen where, where that, where that person, because typically if, if someone's kind of telling you a story like that, they want you around, you're probably a good, a good employee, a high value employee. And you can smell that stuff. Um, so I always feel like it backfires if you're not honest. And, and again, to your point, sometimes you can't be entire, you can't tell the sure. whole story, right? There's, there are things that, certain things that are confidential, but I think giving as much clarity as possible is is always the yeah, right Yeah, it's funny you say that. I was mentoring someone the other day and she's new in leadership and she had said like, well, I just want to make sure they're happy so they never leave. And I said, I have like, maybe this is going to be the worst first mentoring session we've ever had, but like, they're gonna leave. And so like your goal as a leader isn't to avoid your team never leaving your company. Like hopefully they do stay for a really long time and mm -hmm. you get longevity out of them and like they love working for you and they're great. And I've also had people who I got an amazing 14 months out of, they crushed it. They impacted the culture in a positive way. I learned from them and then they grew out of it. I didn't have something more to offer them and they left. And I was able to make an impact on them just as a person and an employee. They did the same for me. And I was happy to like see them go and, and grow somewhere else. Um, and so you can, as a leader, be operating out of fear of losing mm. your good employees. You should be very thoughtful in terms of how you retain good talent. But if it's a natural, like there's a natural break and there's not anything there for them and you can't do anything for them and they have a better opportunity or they could have a better opportunity somewhere else at that point I see myself in service of them as a person and it's it's time for me to like let them go and let them go grow um and then hopefully someday I get to like steal them back or we find a way to work together again. yeah well no no I I love that and I, I feel the same way first as a as a leader in, in any work I'm in I always and this is an agency thing too right my job is to train people to replace me because if I don't do that then I can't move up right yep. 
And I, and I brought that into a lot of different situations. And, and I think, I think it's a remarkable way to manage, right? You almost brainwash yourself into helping other people succeed because, you know, it's self-serving. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, we can use, uh, we can use the great Amanda Weller as an example here. Right. Um, so I hired Amanda, um, a couple, a couple years ago, she was one of my first hires, the collective medical and the marketing team. Phenomenal. You could tell right away, superstar, like hard worker, amazing work ethic, really great work product an amazing attitude. And I learned so much, you know, we talk about learning from mentors, uh, Amanda, despite her being earlier in her career, definitely a mentor for me. She yeah. is, she is an, it turns out to be an amazing leader. And, um, you know, she, is she, as as people do did only was that collected for about two years and that's and that's about a typical tenure I would say yeah. and so I remember uh talking to one of the founders at collective and talking about how excited I was that she was around and how amazing she is and uh he said well how are you gonna keep her and I was like I'm probably not you know she she's gonna she's gonna move on right she's yeah. she's ready for something bigger and we will not grow fast enough to accommodate her um and then and then when when an opportunity came up with you uh, at your previous organization um you know i was more than excited to to help her out and and and, and help her move on right because like you yeah. said like i'm totally gonna steal her back right like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and now she's a director at an organization running markov like i mean you know to me it's like amazing like like, it's awesome. Everybody right? won. <laughs> everybody won. That's exactly right. And and I think that very often it's like you said, and when you're maybe newer to leadership or, or you haven't maybe taken that many different turns in your career, it's really easy to just like to kind of freak out and claw in and try to keep people. And uh, it just never really worked out for me that way. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Another question. So, um, so, you know, you have, you've taken a lot of cool twists in your career and, um, and, and you've, and, and you've been acquired. Sure. But like, you've also made some moves. So how do you know when it's time to go? Or how do you, you personally know when it's time to go? Yeah. So, um, I, it's, I did a workshop on this actually I hosted one a couple weeks ago on that. So what I look for is a few things. Um, I'm, I'm very clear on what my core values are. Like, accountability number one core value for Kristen like if you don't hold people accountable my soul just like dies I can't <laughs> I need accountability with <laughs> so I know what my my core values are I also know what my non-negotiables are so I have a, a few non-negotiables of um I for example I will not feel um put down or spoken down to uh from anyone on my team or leadership or made mm -hmm. to feel less than. Like anytime I feel that way about any company, like it's a non-negotiable. And that comes from early days of my career. I experienced that and was like, this is not for me. So mm -hmm. I, core values and, and non-negotiables. So I know it's time to leave a company and the role itself. Like, am I doing what I wanna be doing to grow myself in my career of whatever is next? And that's fluid, it changes constantly. Like what I wanted to be doing five years ago is different than what I wanna be doing today. So when I start to feel in my gut that those things are out of alignment, that's when I first look internally, like, is there an opportunity to shift that at my company now? Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. And then if there's not, then it's time for me to move on. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's within a year. Sometimes it's seven years. I've been at companies six, seven years. I've been at companies a year, three years. Um, and then my, my strategy for leaving is I have always taken a step up at every company I've gone to. So I've gone from supervisor to manager, manager to director, director to vice president, you know, VP to head of, which is like essentially same as VP, but working towards that C-suite. That's yeah, my yeah. next step. It's a fancier way to say it. Yeah. I get you. So I'm, you know, trying to get there. But so my goal is also like, anytime I leave, I have to level myself up to the next, yeah. to the next step. Um, and part of that's luck, part of it's privilege, part of it's my network, you know, part of it's grit. Uh, it's a lot of different things. I make it sound really easy and I know it's not that easy for everybody, um, but that's essentially been my strategy. And uh, my last strategy is like, anytime I leave a company, even if I was miserable there, like I, I will not burn a bridge. I'm mm -hmm. not going to speak ill of a company. Um, you know, they serve their purpose. They always, you can always learn something even from a negative scenario. 
you usually leave with a couple great friends and connections and influences in your life. So I think every experience can be seen as a positive one, even if there was bad to it. So I never burn a bridge. You never know who's going to be the, you know, C-suite of a, you know, company that you're trying to sell into in a year that used to work at a company you hated. So um, true. That is Those absolutely are kind of my true. Principles Although I, I, I'm kind of like, bye bye. you know, I, I may have burned a bridge or two in my time. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I've burned a few bridges with individuals, but I try to generally, and they needed to be burnt. To me, that's setting a boundary. That's like a clear boundary of like, we don't have a relationship, working relationship anymore. I, I won't talk about you or to you or send anybody your way, but you can go on about your life. You're out of, out of my brain. Yeah. Actually, what I do for that is I write them a letter and then I light it on fire and like let that part of really, go. Yeah, it's huh. a very cathartic release experience. If you yeah. have any people so, in your life that you need to not forgive because that word feels a little uh, for me, but- Maybe you can just take a week off me. and do this. <laughs> so be careful. Google how to safely burn fire in your house. Please don't burn your house down. I don't want like emails that I let. So I'll, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Like we, um, yeah, this is, this is not professional advice. So whatever disclaimer yeah. we need here. Okay. So, so Kristen, you sound so legit when you, when you talk about leadership and career and all this. And, and so I, I know you have a, a coaching business, um, but like the, the way you talk, right. Look, you, you have non-negotiables, you have kind of, you have like a plan listen, I don't have a plan. I'm just like winging it most of the time. Um, and like cool things happen to me and I like go on these journeys or not. Right. Um, but, but I love that. I love that about you that you do have, you know, you talked about loving process and it almost like you kind of have like a process for like life, which is cool. So will you talk a little bit about this business? I want to know about the business, but I also want to know why you started it. Cause that's, I love, I love a hustle. I love entrepreneurs. So, you know, you can work for entrepreneurs and you can be one. Uh, and I would love to hear, you know, how you went down that journey. Yeah, so I started doing mentorship inside of my first startup um, like over a decade ago. And I had a mentor and I mentored someone. And it was kind of just like a buddy system that the company set up of like, we have a bunch of young leaders and no one knows what they're doing. And like, let's figure out if they can teach each other how to do it. Oh, I love that. They just um, put you all together and <laughs> hope you figure it yeah, out. Go talk to her. She'll tell you how to like write somebody up. I don't know. So that was, that was kind of how it started. And, and over time, because I've touched so many different aspects of healthcare and been part of a few very interesting companies um, and had this like fast trajectory of growth, people started coming to me all the time, like former employees, former clients, like current employees and clients saying like, I don't understand how to do this. Like I'm totally lost. I just took a promotion and I'm managing two people. I've never done a one-on-one -on -one before. How do you even do them? Like, I have no idea. And even if you have the best leader at your company, they often don't have capacity to like really groom and mentor and coach you into with all the tools, skills, and resources that you need to get to the next level. Mm. Um, and most people aren't great leaders. Most people are like just above water themselves and don't have capacity to like really coach you. And they could probably also use some support themselves. Um, and there's good and bad to both sides, right? But so I gave a lot of advice and time and coaching away for free over the past five or so years. And um, ended up last year during COVID going through this four month um, like container with this coaching uh, group of women I know called Desire on Fire. And we were working on what our desires for life were. Oh, I love and that. I was surrounded by a bunch of women who were doing life coaching and intimacy coaching and all this coaching. And I was like, I just live in LA. This is BS. Like it's woo woo. Like I don't, what is even a coach? Like this is just another <laughs> LA thing. I'm not for it. And then I was like, oh, I actually do have a desire to help people. Cause I do it all the time. I just have a desire for it to be a business I have and like be mutually beneficial from both impact on changing their lives and also financially it's like okay that I want to say like I'd love to make more money if I can monetize this great so yeah. out came total evolution coaching last August um so I've officially been a business owner for almost a year now awesome. um and yeah I work primarily with women mainly because um I've had a few male clients 
I just like to coach from a place that I know best. And what I know best is being a woman in the workplace and my own experience. So I feel like I have the most, um, I can be in support of women and people identify as women the most. Um, but I have a few male clients that I've worked with as well that I would consider like strong allies who I like love to work with because it helps me think about kind of both sides of things. Um, yeah, I love that. So yeah, I do kind of a variety of coaching and workshops. I also mentor at Bold um, just as a, as a friend and former uh, or leader within the organization. So it's a passion of mine. Um, I had no idea what I was doing and often still don't and, and love having support of people to just say like, what do I, like you, I was like, Kat, what is marketing? Like, I don't even know. That's such a great call. Like, here's a, a PowerPoint. Call. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. Let me send you a thing. <laughs> yeah, let me send you the thing and I'm like, whatever Kat's doing is what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's helpful and uh, I'm, I'm passionate about it and I love helping people. So that's why I do it. So, so talking about, I mean, this, this is the hit like a girl podcast, right. Um, and and the lady boss series. So knowing that you mostly mentor women in professional environments is what, what's like kind of, I don't know, problem is the right question, but like, what's the most common issue or problem that, that women under your mentorship are dealing with? Yeah. Imposter syndrome. Mm. I don't, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not the right person for this role. Um, people pleasing is huge. Like, Mm. I don't want to say no. I don't want them to quit. I don't want them to not like me. I don't want them to think I'm being a bitch. I don't want them to think I'm too bossy. Um, and then how to ask for what they want. How do I get Uh. a raise? How do I get a promotion? Like, how do I tell my boss to, you know, stick it because I hate it here and I'm being treated unequally and unfairly. So Mm. those are the common and I've experienced all of those things. So that's why I feel comfortable talking to people about them because um, I've gone through them myself. I've been in meetings with men and this isn't against men. I love men in general, but like I've been in meetings where men and have spoken over me and ignored me and deliberately looked past me in, in meetings. And I've had, wit- honestly, I've had women do it too. And so it's infuriating. And I've learned that in the workplace, um, women were kind of conditioned to be competition with each other, right? Like mm. we, we didn't, for most of my career, it hasn't been like, everyone gets a seat at the table or we're going to make our own table. It's been like, there's one chair. And if you don't get it, Kristen, Kat does. And so you have to hate Kat. You have to fight her. You have to backstab her if you want that seat over her. And I just want to create my envisionment is like this girls club where we are all in support of each other. We're holding each other. We're creating space for each other um, because the workplace is so much stronger and the, the company will be more successful if the women are holding each other up, speaking up for each other, holding people accountable for giving us space and um, a place at the table. And so it's an, it's kind of an environment and culture. Like I dream of working in and having, I feel like I'm there now with bold, um, but also want to continue to perpetuate that. Like you and I aren't competition, we're allies and we have to learn how to hold each other up and support each other and not beat each other down. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I totally agree. I've, I've been there too. Right. I've, I've, I've had all those, all those, all those problems you just listed all like 100 of them right? Yep. <laughs> where, where you do feel like you're, you're, you're not, you're kind of over your skis a little. And, um, and then, you know, when, when you called and asked about marketing, like what's marketing, uh, which is definitely an oversimplification of our conversation, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, but yeah. And, and what I told you was like, everyone's just making it up, right? Like if anyone tell, like if any marketing person tells you, oh yeah, I got lead gen figured out my lead scoring is totally on point hundred percent. The PowerPoint you made for your board is total bullshit. And I know it, right? Like no one does that right. <laughs> so It's all made up. Um, but I, I think like, I, I had a, a very early mentor tell me that and I was in a meeting, a kind of a new subject matter. I wasn't an expert in, and I remember really kind of like closing in on my, like my posture changed. And um, he actually pulled me out of the room, out of the boardroom and was like, put your shoulders up. Like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't know this space. It was biotech. I was like, I don't know biotech. And he was like, none of us do either. And even the client probably doesn't. So put your shoulders back, get in there. Right. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and it made a big difference just to hear that. And, and later we had a conversation where he, he kind of sat me down he's like, I don't know how to run a business, right? I don't know how to do any of these things that I'm doing. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Like, 
No, it makes me think I, I just hired a dog trainer for this rescue dog we got over COVID because we did that with everyone else in the world. And nice. this trainer came for the first time yesterday and he's like, if you're walking confidently, holding the leash, walking next to the dog, shoulders back, you know, good posture, walking, you, you know where you're going, the dog's going to follow. And literally one sentence, my dog walks entirely different on a leash now. It's true. And I, I love yeah, that. And I think about it from a leadership perspective, not that my employees are dogs, right? But like, if you're going into the room, you're confident, you're like, this is what we're doing. Here's how we're going to do it. This is going to be amazing. How does, how does that make you feel or your employees feel inside of your team feel rather right. than going in and being like, holy crap, we're launching this thing and I don't know what we're doing, but we're going to figure it out. But like, I don't really know. Like you can be having all that in your head and call me and I'll listen to it, but don't say that to your team. Oh my gosh. That's all going on in my head pretty much 24 seven. I'm like, yeah. whoa, I don't all know how to hard. do this. I don't know how I'm going to get this done. Walking into the room, keeping it up here and going, all right, I got this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's something, you know, fake it till you make it. Like, I think there's something to that. Right. Cause I've yeah. definitely been faking it for like years. Um, but, and, and I actually just had someone today tell me like, Oh, like I want to be like you when I grow up and I'm like, well, I'm like really not that old. But, um, uh, and I was like, Hey, you need to know something. And it's like, I really don't know a lot. Like, I just, I just like act like I'm really in charge. <laughs> it's it's kind of 80% of it, though. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, okay. All right. All right. So we've been talking a long time and, um, I have all these other questions that I haven't even asked you yet. So, um, so you, you have this coaching thing, you've had like all these different iterations of Kristen in the professional world. Um, it seems like you're a startup girl where you're, you know, you're into staying up for three nights straight and doing something awesome and like, you know, doing it again. Um, but like, so, so what would you consider your biggest professional strength? Um, biggest professional strength from like a tactical perspective is like I get things done mm. like if you give me something to do it will absolutely get done like I will figure out how to do it you can go here's the mess I have no idea just go fix it it's gonna get fixed like every person I've ever worked for has always been like I know if it's with you it's getting done and it's gonna get done well um so I think that has gotten me very far is that people know that the work is, can be trusted with me. It's going to get done. It's going to get done well. It's going to be thoughtful. And if it's not right, or it doesn't hit the mark, it's not for a lack of like effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that that grit and tenacity part of people is just like, I, more often than not, when I'm, when I'm talking to a female in a leadership position, um, like that, she'll say that, right? Like I yeah. get stuff done and I figure it out. Yep. Right. Which I think is awesome. All right. What's your biggest weakness? Like, what's the thing you screw up on the most? Um, I can be very quick to react. Um, so I can want to, I go into like problem solving immediately rather than like, let's slow down. Let's think about like all the whole picture and then find the prop, the solution and like, make sure it's the right one. I'm like, well, let's go do this. And then well, if it doesn't work, we'll go do this. So I know that about myself and ways to like calm myself down from that, but I definitely am like, we got to fix it. We got to fix it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm the same way. I react like, um, yeah. like all the big feelings. I actually just interviewed my sister for our lady boss TV show. Um, and, and we're very alike professionally and, and personally, which probably leads to some conflict, but we both the same way, like we have these really big feelings. And so, you know, like someone will piss me off and I'll just want to destroy them. Like, I'll just want to take them down. Right. Professionally, figuratively, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> but I've learned, like, I really do need to sleep on it. And like, I really need to stop myself from like replying or, or calling the them up. The power or, of an email going to draft and not send. Yes. <laughs> put it in draft. Yeah. Just put it over here. Or, or like, you know, maybe even your, your letter burning. Down. Slack message is shut down. Oh yeah. The Slack, you gotta, yeah, you gotta <laughs> shut the Slack down. That is for sure. But you could, I mean, like I might try this whole letter burning thing, right? Like I might just be like, you know, figuratively destroying someone and just, I'll just burn that letter. Just oh. Let yeah. it go. <laughs> Again, safety first, but yes. Burning, safety first. Burning letters is really powerful. It makes you very happy. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay, all right. So um, so what advice would you give former self Kristen? 22 year old, great recession, starting out Kristen. 
whatever advice I would have given myself, I wouldn't have listened because at 22 <laughs> years old, I thought I knew everything. I was like, I, I have done it. Like I have a job. I have went to college. I, did all I have things. my cubicle. I have to do. Yeah. Like I have a cubicle. I have a phone, a headset, like whatever. So I don't think I would have listened to any of my advice. And I also feel like I'm in the chair talking to you today because of every experience I've had, good and bad, all wrapped up and like everything's a lesson. So I don't know, maybe like you're not as bad as you think you are. It's definitely going to get worse in your 30s. Like, <laughs> love your body right now. This is the best it's going to be. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can. <laughs> that is just- oh my gosh that's amazing that's amazing oh wait okay so this is this is another one of my favorite questions you just brought it up like the good and the bad got you where you are totally agree same over here I have some really painful experiences that helped me get to the next level um but so what what is your most painful lesson learned that you can share <laughs> yeah sometimes um, we can't share these things <laughs> My, my boyfriend, when I first started dating him, he kept saying, um, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Mm. Um, and what he means by that is like, if you want to be right, like you might lose a customer because of it or lose your job or like lose your promotion because like you had to fight to like be right. And I am a, I am a woman of integrity, equality, liberty. Like I am like that kind of a person. So I... 100% need and want to be right all of the time at whatever cost. Um, and so I think like for me, it was learning that like, it's not always being right. Isn't always like, it's not going to get you the outcome you want. And it's often like very detrimental to like the relationship or the solution or the challenge that you're in. Um, and so I'm, I'm now shifting my mindset that I want to be rich and mm. the theoretical rich, right. Uh, rather than being right all the time, which is very hard for me. I, I well, so I, I love that. So you said that on a recent clubhouse where we were like hanging out on the clubhouse and, yeah. um, and I love that because the way I kind of translated that in my brain was, um, win, win the war, not the battle, right. Yeah. Like think, think beyond the immediate need yeah. to just, you know, um, sucker punch someone for, you know wronging you or just, or just having like, or just being wrong in general. Right. I yeah. love that. I think there's, um, a lot of merit to, uh, kind of like taking a breath, which is something I like, it's like my, like, I mean, I have like a thousand weaknesses, but that is one of my biggest weaknesses is not taking that breath and saying, yeah. this is fine. I'm going to work with this. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? That's what I'm always asking myself. Right. right. My problem is I have such big feelings that usually I'm like, it's worth it. It's worth Absolutely. it. <laughs> Going to the grave on this one. Yeah, so yeah, I have, a lot, I have a lot to work on. So this is basically like I'm coaching myself through all these interviews with lady bosses. So yeah, all right, all right. So so what, anything else that you wanna share? I know we've been talking, I've taken up a lot of your time um, about bold, about career, about like lady bosses, coaching, like you have so many things going on, so many things to share. What, what would you like to leave us with? Yeah, so if you're in healthcare and interested in learning about bold, we contract with plant health plans and providers. We also go direct to consumers. So if you have a aging mother, grandmother, father, a family friend, um, and you want them to have a really great safe fitness program, um, it's agebold.com. So we want people to age boldly. Um, and then if you need a coach, cause you're like, yes, all these things. And I just don't know. <laughs> um, my website is, um, www.totalevolutioncoaching.com. And you can always also connect with me on LinkedIn, Kristen Halleck. So yeah. that's awesome. 